Hello, hello everyone. So I want to give you guys a review for this book. It's called The Histories by Launicos Chaco Condiles. His name is a little bit difficult to pronounce, but with the power of the phonics game, you will be able to uh, pull that off and pronounce this guy's name. This book comes in two volumes. So volume one, and then over here, well, this is volume one. This is volume two. And altogether, uh, they both consist of 10 books. Good and the bad parts about reading Launicos. Well, for one thing, I'll just start out with the bad because uh, that takes the quickest to explain because there's not really a whole lot of uh, bad things about this book. Uh, for one thing, it's written by a Greek historian who lived at the time of the fall of Constantinople. So the book is one of our sources for the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, which took place in 1453. And he was someone who was very close to the Ottoman world. And he had a lot, a lot of knowledge and a lot of insight into that world. Uh, so that's really the main reason to read Launicos. It's that you are reading a primary source account for that historical period, for the event of the conquest of Constantinople, but also for all of the events that uh, took place around that event. Now, my only problem with reading Launicos, well, I have two issues with, re with reading Launicos. For one thing, um, he does make some errors, I believe, because when you you read his stuff and then you read the translator's notes and he'll he will get some things wrong according to the translator. Uh, I remember just 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 to give you one detail off the top of my head. Uh, I think he says that Muslims pray more than five times a day or something like that. I don't remember, but according to the translator, he makes some uh some uh, mistakes in his details. Uh, another thing about Launicos is that he kind of confuses you. <laughs> like, he he confuses you. Um, you have to really focus when you're reading Launicos. It's very difficult to get off track when you're reading him because he'll do this thing where, for example, he will mention someone's name and then he'll mention someone else's name and then he'll continue he'll continue talking and then all of a sudden he'll say something like and he meaning one of these persons did such a thing or said such a thing and it's like well hold on who's the he is it that other guy or is it this other person that you mentioned or for example he'll men he'll mention a king and he'll say you know king so and so did this or king so and so said that and then he'll mention another king and then he'll talk about something else he'll, he'll he'll bring up something that one of those kings did and then he'll say and then the king and it's like well which king you just mentioned two kings or he'll mention multiple different people and then he'll say and he did this well which he which one which one are you talking about and even the translator in his notes will say in numerous parts of of the of the notes uh, this statement is really difficult to understand. This statement is confusing. And even so even the translator, who is an expert in the Greek language and in you know, Byzantine history, uh, will admit in several times in his notes that he has difficulty understanding Launicos. So Launicos is a little bit difficult to understand. But that's just it's all really minor uh, in comparison to the pros uh, about reading Launicos. The pros about reading Launicos are much uh larger, much numerous than the cons. So the pros outweigh the cons is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the pros of reading Launicos is that you're reading a book written by somebody who lived at that time. And you see a lot, of, numerous times the translator will say, well, he's wrong about this and wrong about that. And in some cases, the translator is correct. Like, for example, um, when he talks about Islam, you know, he does get some things it, he, he is in error about some things, right? Very minor mistakes. But honestly, when translators say things like, well, this person's wrong about you know, all these different things, is, is this person really wrong? This person was there. This person was living at that time. You can't say he's, I, 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 I'm not really buying into this narrative that this person is wrong about so many things when that person was alive at that time. 
so I, I, I give much more weight to an historian who lived at the time period that he's writing about than someone who's writing in, you know, the year 2006. Uh, you're reading a book written by someone who lived at the time of the fall of Constantinople, the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, you're living, this, this person was living at that time, living around the time of Vlad the Impaler and, you know, all of these events that historians continue to talk about. Launikos was there. So you're reading uh, a book written by someone with immense insight. And that's what I really like about reading Launikos. As confusing as he can be sometimes, he gives you insight into the nitty gritty dark realities of how life was at that time, how life was in the 15th century. And he gives you all of these stories that are really bizarre. And these stories can go from, you know, being perverted to being just downright nightmarish and horrific. For example, he mentions a story where some Italian guy who was the king of some Italian city, I don't remember which one, uh, I don't remember if it was uh, Genoa or Venice, one of those big Italian city-states, and it talks about how his wife was banging his stepson. Pretty weird. Uh, and then he gets into this other story, uh, and this story is in part two, or it's in um, volume two of his work. And it mentions how there was this very, very small, brief war between Venice and the Ottoman Empire, right? The, the, the Venetians had their brief counter-jihad movement, you know? It wasn't very impressive. Uh, but uh, the Venetians had territory in Greece. And the Venetians declared war on the Ottoman Empire because the Ottomans took territory from the Venetians. And so the Venetians said, okay, well... You know, if we don't do something about it, the Ottomans are just going to keep taking things from us. Uh, and the Venetians were very moderate about the Ottoman Empire, right? They had a lot of trade relations with the Ottoman Empire. They were making a lot of money with the Ottoman Empire. And the last thing that they wanted was a war with the Ottoman Empire. But nonetheless, they went to war and they got their asses kicked. Uh, and in, in that brief conflict, uh, there was this little Greek region that was controlled by Venice it was actually a town. It was called Mythone. And it had a population of about 500 people. And the book talks about how Mehmet II, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire at that time, invaded this little town. And it's uh, the book says that he took the 500 inhabitants of this town and sawed them in half. And he talks about how the Ottomans had this method of sawing people in half. He talks about how the blade, I think, was somewhat dull so as to make the excruciating pain so much more excruciating. You know, just to make the uh, the experience of being sawed in half much more unpleasant than it already is, uh, to give more pain to the victim. Uh, he talks about how the Ottoman Empire, you know, declared war on the Greek island of Lesbos. And... He talks about how the reason why he declared war on Lesbos was because the ruler of Lesbos was allowing Spanish pirates, or really was harboring Spanish pirates who were raiding Ottoman territory. So you had these Spanish pirates who were raiding Ottoman territory, taking stuff from the Ottoman Empire, and then they would live in Lesbos. And if you look at a map, Lesbos is extremely close to Turkey. Uh, it's right there on the Aegean, Aegean, Aegean Sea, I don't know. However, however you pronounce it, Aegean, Aegean, whatever. But uh, Lesbos is today a part of Greece. And if you look at a map, it is smack right next to Turkey. I don't know why anyone is living in Lesbos right now. I mean, how could you live in Lesbos? It's right there next to Turkey. You're smack right there next to a country that wants to invade you. But anyway, um, you had these pirates, Spanish pirates. Uh, the book says that they were from Aragon, which is a region of Spain, and they were raiding Ottoman territory, and then they were living in Lesbos. So the Ottoman Empire declared war in Lesbos. You are harboring uh, pirates in your in your island. And also the ruler of Lesbos, I believe, murdered his brother. And so the Sultan said, uh, you know, because you murdered your brother and because you are harboring pirates who are raiding my territory, I am going to invade you. So 
uh, Mehmet II invaded Lesbos, and uh, before he invaded Lesbos, there was this little, there was this little Muslim boy who lived in the port of the Sultan, which means that he was a sex slave for the pederast Sultan Mehmet II. And this book does get into this uh, topic of the pederasty of the Sultan Mehmet II. Mehmet II was uh, a fanatical pederast. He was uh, an absolutely uh, disgusting individual. This little, uh, this young boy uh, ran away from the port. Uh, he, he ran away from, you know, the sex uh, slavery dungeon of the Sultan, and he ended up in Lesbos, and he was given refuge in Lesbos, and he converted to Christianity. Well, after he converted to Christianity, the ruler of Lesbos, it turned out, was also a pederast, and the ruler of Lesbos uh, took this young boy as his quote-unquote lover. And the book says that he became the lover of the ruler of Lesbos, which means that he sodomized this young boy. It's pretty, pretty demonic stuff. It's pretty sickening. So, after the Ottoman Empire invaded Lesbos, uh, which wasn't that difficult because Lesbos was such a weak little island, uh, this young boy was, uh, this young boy returned back to Ottoman territory and the Sultan spotted him and the Sultan noticed that this young boy was once a part of his uh, pederast dungeon. And so he realized that this ruler of Lesbos uh, had taken one of his sex slaves. So the ruler of Lesbos, he actually, uh, w when he surrendered the island, he, um, you know, he made terms with the Sultan and then eventually he actually converted to Islam in order to be on good terms with the Sultan. Uh, the Sultan never liked him and when he realized that this uh, ruler of Lesbos, this lesbian ruler, uh, had taken one of his sex slaves, uh, he executed him. So there's a lot of stories like this in the book. It's very, very grim, very dark stuff. Uh, another thing that he talks about is how the Venetians were very cozy with the Ottoman Empire. And the Venetians uh, wanted to go to war with the Ottomans after so long, uh, after <laughs> after the Ottomans invaded all of Greece, after the Ottomans, you know, destroyed the Byzantine Empire, after the Ottomans uh, took so much territory, eventually the Venetians said, oh, I think we should go to war with them because, you know, they, they, they took one of our territories. And the Venetians were very financially minded people. They loved money. Uh, they loved money more than anything in the world. And they said that, well, we can take some of the Ottoman territory and then we can tax those inhabitants and make more money. That's what, that's what the Venetians said. But it's very interesting. Uh, they had a meeting with the King of Hungary, the Venetians did, about going to war with the Ottoman Empire. And they asked the Hungarians, for assistance, uh, or they actually told the Hungarians that we can help you in your war against the Ottomans because the Hungarian, Hungary uh, was really at the forefront of fighting the Ottomans. It's really fascinating, but like Hungary was one of those places that was just a bulwark against Ottoman expansion. It's pretty impressive how the Hungarians were able to fight so effectively against Ottoman forces. Um, and the book does talk about this. Uh, but the Venetians, they made a meeting with the Hungarians and they said, we can help you fight against the, the Ottomans and we can give you a lot of money and we can give you, you know, thousands of Venetian knights. And this is what the King of Hungary told the Venetians. And this is what I found so eye opening. Uh, he said, oh, Venetians, you speak well and you seem to be men who understand many things well. You think carefully about how to conduct your lives and what needs to be done. But you seem to have forgotten that we have often invited you to join us in war against the Turks, and yet you have not wanted to assist us even when the great pontiff pleaded with you. So even when the Pope was pleading with you to fight the Ottomans, you didn't want to do it. Instead, you made treaties with the barbarian and totally disregarded us. At that time, you were saying that we were making unreasonable requests of you when we were asking for your aid against the barbarian. You who had not suffered anything at the hands of the barbarian. And the book also talks about how the Venetians went to the Pope and they said, hey, Holy Father, can you join us in war against the Ottomans? And the Pope at that time, Pius II, said, no, I don't want to go to war with the Ottomans because I'm too busy fighting uh, the people in Rimini. Uh, Rimini was in a years-long war with the Vatican, with the papal armies, and the war lasted, like I said, for years. And so the Pope said, no, 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 I'm too busy fighting uh, Rimini. I don't want to fight the Ottomans, which really goes to show you that at no point in the Islamic Christian wars 
uh, were Christians not fighting each other. Christians were always fighting each other. Europeans were always fighting each other. And, and I just want to say one detail because somebody mentioned this in the comments from my last video. Uh, when I say Christian, yes, I mean Christian with a small c. The problem with Christendom uh, was that it really forgot that line of Christ where he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And the Christians got really too much into this world, too much into power, too much so bent on power and financial gain. And there were a lot of people who were Christian in name only. You know, the idea of being a Christian in those days was extremely expected. You had to be a Christian. You had to consider yourself a Christian. It was very rare for someone to, you know, be a proud heretic. Uh, being Catholic or being Christian was something that was extremely expected of you. So, of course, you know, you have Vlad the Impaler who is expressing his faith in God in one moment, and then in another moment, he's impaling tens of thousands of people. But in this book, you get into the nitty gritty realities of that world, that it wasn't all Christian, that it was very dark. There was a lot of sick things like pederasty and, you know, sawing people in half and all sorts of sick things. Um, and if you are interested in the world of Byzantium, then you are definitely going to enjoy reading the histories by Launikos Chacocondiles. Uh, 